Okay, hi everybody and welcome to Tourism Events Queensland webinar today, The Legal Risks of Doing Business Online. We're very excited to have Jamie White um, from Pod Legal um, to um, do the guest presenting for us today for this one. Uh, very exciting. So just before we do get started and I introduce Jamie to you all, uh, I just wanted to let you know with your control panel there on the right hand side, you'll see at the very top you've got a, a, a white arrow in a red box. That one just moves your panel in and out if you wanted to push it out of the way of the screen. The one below that is a mute button. Now you're all on mute at the moment, so don't, um, if you're trying to yell at me at the moment and ask me a question, I can't hear you. <laughs> now we do that for very good reasons because we get too much feedback, um, so we turn everybody off. Um, below that is a webcam, so you should be able to see hopefully me waving and Jamie um, underneath my webcam, hopefully. Um, and um, and then below that you'll see um, uh, you should have a hand that you can raise. So that basically means that if you have a question you can use your hand or down in the lower half of that control panel you'll see a questions area. So if you have a question throughout, um, please either raise your hand or type your question in there and we can I can quickly interrupt Jamie if we're at a point that I can do that. Um, otherwise um, we can maybe leave it towards the end of the webinar, so just bear that in mind. So what I might just do is ask everybody to raise your hand so I know that you can hear me and that you can see us. So if you can do that, here we go. Yep, fantastic. So that's great. So it looks like everybody can hear me and see me, which is great. Thank you very much. Now I'll put your hands down. So uh, thank you for that. So as I said, any questions throughout, just please let us know either in those, one of those two ways. So first of all, I'm going to introduce Jamie for you. So Jamie, and I'm going to read this so I can get this right. <laughs> so Jamie White is a solicitor director and owner of Pod Legal, a law firm practicing exclusively in the areas of intellectual property, technology and social media law. Jamie is registered trademark attorney, solicitor of the Supreme Court of Queensland and High Court of Australia. He is an adjunct teaching fellow at Bond University and the coordinator lecturer of the electronic commerce and the law specialist subject. Wow. Jamie has been featured in the media in more than 12 countries and is in used limited contact for knowledge and content relating to intellectual property, technology and social media law matters. So we've got a very good person speaking for us today, so which is fantastic. Um, and I think Jamie doesn't sleep much. <laughs> No, I don't. How did you know that? Though? Uh, yeah, there's a pretty good indication, I think, with what all everything that you do have on your plate. So, <laughs> okay. So now I'll just quickly check. I have got a hand up at the moment, so let me just check um, with you, Karen. Um, I've just taken you off mute, Karen. Did you have a question? Karen? Okay, maybe not. I'll put you back on mute, Karen, and take your hand away just in case. But if you have got another question, just please uh, let us know. That's not a problem. Um, okay, all right. So over to you, Jamie. Thank you very much, Susan, and thanks uh, for the, the introduction. Always guaranteed a good introduction when you write it yourself. Uh, so that's one positive right there. Um, Welcome everyone, uh, it's great to uh, be here this morning and doing this webinar with you. Um, it is called The Legal Risks of Doing Business Online and today uh, we're going to go through a few things but firstly um, we're going to, uh, uh, throughout the webinar we're going to discuss the eight most common mistakes when doing business online. Now up until this morning that was the seven most common mistakes but I'm just seeing more and more mistakes in one particular uh, facet of the law and doing business online, I had to add it, so we'll, we'll get to that today and I'll point it out at the time. Um, we're going to run through some case studies and, and some of these are visual, uh, others aren't, um, but I think that they will be useful to highlight uh, some of the do's and don'ts when you're engaging um, online, whether it be through social media or, or just carrying out business in general in the online environment. Um, I'm also going to point out some uh, or provide you with some practical solution and some solutions and also some useful resources. Now I'm going to refer to the Pod Legal Learning Centre um, on numerous occasions today and the reason I'm going to uh, uh, refer you to it uh, is because that's where we um, provide a lot of 
free and useful resources. Okay, and they are free. You don't need to uh, sign in, hand over your details, or anything like that. Um, but they come in the shape and form of ebooks and uh, articles, mostly. A few cartoons on there as well, um, which highlight some important legal messages. Okay, so to start with, a little bit of background. Um, I looked this up this morning uh, and, and had to change this number 44.6. It was 39.6. Um, which indicates that the amount of businesses that now have an online presence is on the increase and they're fairly fresh statistics so that's good but still uh, not near as many as we might think. Um, also by way of background there is a tendency to overlook legal issues in the online environment. Um, I think we're getting better uh, at this but I think there's still a very strong tendency for people to think well we're doing business online so therefore you know, the rules don't apply, but uh, I can assure you they do and I think in an hour's time you'll agree with me that there are plenty of rules that do apply uh, when you're doing business online. Also, uh, from our experiences, which uh, are fairly vast, uh, we're finding that about 9 out of 10 websites, if not more, are exposing the owners of those websites to legal risks. So there's some sort of a risk area associated with the website, so it's very important that you consider all aspects of your website and the way that you do business online and, and maybe consult a, uh, a specialist lawyer to, to identify any risks that you may be uh, exposed to. Um, also, failure to comply with changing legal rules could be fatal to your business and the legal rules are always developing. Uh, for example, there's always new cases which shape the law and interpret the laws, um, but also uh, some of the legislation, it, it you know, changes from time to time, or I guess all of it does, and um, particularly with respect to privacy laws, uh, there's some changes uh, going on at the moment, and, and the amended Privacy Act, the amended version of the Privacy Act, uh, comes into force in about March next year, and we've got a bit of work to do around that to get compliant. Now, Susan, can we have a show of hands who watched Four Corners? Sorry, Jamie, I think his audio has just popped out a little bit. Are you there, Jamie? Can you hear me? Hello. Audio, Jamie. Hello. Oh, are you there? So I guess we need to determine who's going to be liable um, for our website and social media pages, and that will be you as the owner of the website or the registrant of any social media page. You will be liable for all content, and that includes third-party content. So any posts or comments engagement that uh, might take place through your website or social media pages you'll be liable for whether you know it's there or not. Now Susan just again confirming whether or not you can hear me. I can now um, I'll just get everybody else um, if you can now hear Jamie because you just dropped out there for a moment Jamie so I'm not sure what happened so if okay. anyone could put your hands back up again for me so I can just make sure you can hear Jamie again. Okay, yep, we're coming back. So it looks like we're, we, we've got your audio. So you just dropped out for a moment there, so I'm not sure what happened. Okay, would you like me to just go back a slide? That might be a good idea, yes, that would be fantastic. Okay. So we're just talking about some background facts. And I was saying, uh, I'll pick it up from the 9 out of 10's uh, sentence, but uh, around 90% of websites that we assess and we're exposed to, we uh, find that they are exposing the owner to, to legal risk. Uh, so that's... Uh, a really interesting fact that uh, is based on our experiences, as I say. And the last point I want to make there is that legal rules are always changing. An example of that is the, the cases that are handed down, they shape our laws, and also legislation that changes from time to time. And in that regard, uh, uh, we have some changes going on at the moment to the Australian Privacy Act, and we'll discuss that briefly later on in this webinar. But uh, there's some new changes to that legislation that come into play 
in March 2014. We've got a little bit of work to get compliant, work to do to get compliant there. Um, the question I just asked a moment ago, Susan, before I dropped out or while I was dropped out was, I was wondering how many of our listeners today saw the Four Corners uh, episode last night, which was on uh, data and the, the treatment of data uh, by government and corporate. Okay, so for those, yep, yeah, put your hand up, show everybody. Hands on that. Uh, looks like one. <laughs> okay, I encourage anyone that uh, missed it uh, to to find the link. You can live stream it, and, and it was a, an excellent uh, episode. Hopefully, uh, wasn't too scary or won't be too scary, but uh, very important things to consider uh, in, in handing over your information and and treating. Uh, treating the way that you treat your, your customers and clients information as well, but we'll get onto that later on. Okay, so with uh, power comes great responsibility um, and we need to consider liability uh, associated with website or social media pages. And the first question is who will be liable? And uh, the answer is the owner of a website or registrant of a social media page will be liable for all content uh, displayed on the website or social media pages, and that includes content posted by third parties. Now that's a well-established uh, uh, fact of law. Um, there's been cases uh, handed down establishing that very thing. So you need to uh, turn your mind and review not only your content, but content posted by third parties. There are big consequences uh, that come with liability, and sometimes they come in the form of financial penalties, so it might be a fine in relation to spamming, uh, it could be uh, pay, uh, an award of damages to a third party if you're uh, stealing their content. Um, but importantly also, outside the, the money uh, is the potential damage that um, some misconduct uh, uh, will, will have uh, upon your brand. So definitely brand damage is something that we want to be thinking as well as breaking the law or not breaking the law. Okay, so that's, that's the background and liability. We'll get into the eight mistakes now, and some of these I'll go through fairly quickly. Others will have case studies and take a bit longer, but importantly, we're going to uh, have some question time at the end. But Susan, I'm happy to take a couple of questions along the way also. So the first mistake, and it's a very common one, relates to copyright infringement. So I guess to make sure that we understand uh, copyright infringement well, we need to first understand copyright. So what is it? Um, well, firstly, you can't copyright an idea. It needs to be an expression of an idea and not the idea itself. So I can't say, oh, I've got this fantastic idea for a song. I thought about it last night while I was laying in bed. I, that's not copyright. Uh, I need to write down the lyrics. I need to record the tune, all that sort of stuff. Uh, you can't say, I've got a great idea for a book. You need to write a manuscript. Do you need to register copyright in Australia? No, you don't. It's automatic. So if you set out today and write some content, some original content for your website, automatically copyright will exist in that content. Okay, so you do not need to register it in Australia and you cannot. Uh, in the United States, for example, you can. Who owns copyright? This is really, really important. Well, the first owner of copyright is going to be the uh, person that uh, creates that original work. So if I write the uh, uh, content for my website, I'm the first owner of it. Um, if, uh, if I do it pursuant to a contract for services. So if someone said to me, Jamie, would you write some content for me from my website? Um, I'd firstly probably say I'm the wrong person, but after that uh, I'd uh, possibly write it. And uh, I, as the author, the creator of that work, would be the owner of that copyright, irrespective of being pay, uh, paid for it. It's very important that an assignment of copyright takes place, and that has to be in writing. So there should be a document, uh, a fairly simple document, that says, I, Jamie, will uh, assign the copyright to whoever engaged me, and there needs to be a fee involved. So quite often it might be a dollar. They, they pay you to write the content, but the assignment takes place for a single dollar, but it must be a, a monetary amount. Now, in terms of copyright and ownership, there are some exceptions. So if you write some content, for example, for your employer, you will be doing it on behalf of the employer. They will own it. It, it, it. Nothing else matters. It doesn't matter that you're being paid or anything like that. The Copyright Act says that you will uh, create it for your employer. So some ownership, uh, ownership considerations must take place whenever you engage third-party uh, 
or third parties to create copyright material for you. So, you know, maybe think about the party that records a, a video for you for your website, or they create a logo for your new business, or write you a manual. They're all creative works, they're all original works. Copyright will be owned by the person that you're engaging with. So, very, very important issue to consider, and often uh, disputes will uh, follow around ownership. Use of the copyright symbol, um, usually it's just uh, use the C symbol or the word copyright. The first year of publication, so if you wrote that website content today, it would be 2013, and then you identify ownership through uh, details of the owner. So it might be you as an individual, it might be your company name. It cannot be a business name. A business name isn't capable of owning anything. So it's you as a person or your company. So. Now that we're experts on copyright, uh, what is copyright infringement? Well, basically that takes place where another party does an act which infringes upon the exclusive rights of the copyright owner. So really uh, the thing that happens a lot is the reproduction of someone else's work. That is copying. Um, that will be an infringement. Some examples might be the unauthorized reprodu reproduction of text. So, you know, borrowing uh, content, textual content or images from a third party website. Uh, I know that we're getting more savvy and sophisticated around this, um, but we still see instances where people just uh, rip content from third party websites, dump it on their own, claim it as their own. Very easy for any party uh, to track um, who's using their content and images these days. So please don't engage in that sort of conduct. Um, while we're talking about copyright infringements, so I'll quickly dispel a myth. And that is if you change it 10%, that'll be fine. Uh, that's not the case. That's the sort of thing that uh, you hear around the barbecue table and, and, and it's wrong. Um, if you uh, reproduce without authorization a substantial part of someone's work, it will be copyright infringement. So we need to know what substantial part means. And it's not a percentage and it, it's about quality of content rather than quantity. Okay, so if uh, we're talking about a song and you rip off the, the chorus, um, that's probably a substantial part. Um, if you take a chapter from someone's book, that will be a substantial part. So I encourage you all not to uh, use third party content unless you have permission to do so. Now let's have a look at a case study, the Cool Hunter uh, uh, Facebook page case study, and that involved takedown of a Facebook page by Facebook for copyright infringement. Susan, I'm sure you've uh, seen this one before. Okay, so we have the uh, Cool Hunter Facebook page. Here it is. This screenshot was taken from a few months ago, so uh, the number of likers is around 36,000. Um, basically, it's a, a Facebook page um, driving people to a website, and that website, the, the Cool Hunter website, is all about um, uh, all things. Uh, it's a curation of design and culture uh, images and, and uh, stories. So this particular Facebook page, it had nearly 790,000 fans. It was increasing it up to 2,000 fans per day. It was generating over 10,000 click-throughs to its website per day. So you can see the real value of the Facebook page driving traffic uh, to the website and no doubt it was advertising and advertisers um, you know, contributing money uh, through that website. Um, Mr. Tikos, who was the owner of the website and the Facebook page, said it was an extremely uh, important part of his strategy with 2.1 monthly site visits. Um, his account was permanently disabled by Facebook in October last year due to repeated infringement. So what happened there was Mr. Tikos went to uh, check out his Facebook page uh, uh, this morning, for example. He saw that it was taken down. It must have been the, the shock of his life. Um, he made several attempts to get in touch with Facebook but was unsuccessful in finding out why. His Facebook page was taken down. He finally found out that it was due to repeat copyright infringement and what was happening was he was uh, taking content from third party websites, uh, the content uh, related to text and images and he was posting it on his Facebook page. It was obviously a series of complaints and Facebook acted. Uh, his new Facebook page as of today has 44,000 or just over uh, likes. So a, lot, a far cry from the 788 that he had uh, up until October last year. So I guess the, the point there is um, the risk is real. It, it can happen. So you think about all the, the resources and, and blood, sweat and tears that you invest in your Facebook uh, presence 
to wake up and find that it's taken away from you due to uh, infringement uh, would, would be an absolute nightmare for most of us. Susan, just checking that uh, everyone can still hear and, and you can still hear? Yes, all good. Fantastic. I'll take a breath uh, in a moment and ask if there's any questions, but I guess the solution around copyright infringement is really simple. Use your own material or obtain a license, that is get permission from a third party to use their material. Okay, and the example of that might be um, using an iStock image. Okay, you need to get, uh, uh, or there is a license, permission allocated with use of that image uh, in return for payment of a, a small fee. Now, in respect of your organisation, Susan, I understand that there's a data bank of uh, imagery that people can use. Would you like to take the opportunity to just elaborate on that? Yes, uh, we, we do. We have an image library that um, you can access and um, I know um, our low res images are free to use but our high res images do have a small fee attached to some of those images. Um, and, but don't forget your RTO will also have a stock of images that you can access as well. So you've got plenty of um, images that you can use with permission um, and not have yourself get into any issues. <laughs> But then, of course, like Jamie was saying as well, there's iStock and Shutterstock and Getty Images and there's, there's tons of other places that you can um, access images, some for a small fee, uh, but at least you've got that permission to use it, which is exactly um, where we would be suggesting for anyone to grab their images, unless they're your own, of course. Thanks, Susan. And, and a valuable point I'll add here is we're seeing at our firm a real trend and it's a significant trend in clients receiving infringement notices from third parties for you, overseas and Australian for using images uh, that were on the internet and quite often Getty's Images uh, is a company that's uh, enforcing rights but um, it's really, really important that you do have permission for, uh, to use third party content because there's a real business opportunity out there for uh, uh, photographers and lawyers alike to assert rights in relation to their content. Uh, we're seeing very much of it, so beware. That's my big warning for the day. That's my biggest warning. Okay, so in terms of uh, resources, uh, if you go to the Pod Legal Learning Centre, you'll see that there's articles, and in the Intellectual Property Law section, there's articles relating to copyrights. So there's a, a few beauties in there around myths and uh, and all the rest of it. So. Jamie, I have once again they're, they're free. I did just send out the link to your learning centre as well to the group. So if you all have a look in your chat box Wonderful. down in the lower right hand corner, you'll see I've given you the link to the learning centre there. So if anybody needs to look at some of those resources, go for it. Great, thank you. Okay, so that's copyright. Mistake number two. Um, or, or before we go on to mistake number two, Susan, is there any question I, I can probably take one question now in relation to copyright? Uh, by the looks of it, um, no, no questions at this stage and no one's raised their hand. Great, moving on. Mistake number two, very common, trademark infringement. Okay, so firstly trademarks, what are they? Well, they can be many things and, and rather than me uh, read all these things out, uh, I'll get you to uh, read through yourself. But put simply, uh, trademarks are used to distinguish the goods or services from one trader from those of other traders. So think think about um, Apple and Macintosh, uh, Apple and uh, you know Microsoft, for example, um, or Nokia, or or, or McDonald's and uh, Burger King, or Hungry Jacks. They're trademarks. They're used to distinguish one product or service from another. Um, use of symbols. We have the R symbol in the the capital R in the circle and the TM symbol. Now the TM symbol. Anyone can use in relation to their trademarks as of right now, and, and basically uh, the TM symbol denotes if you have an unregistered trademark. Okay, so you don't need to have filed an application or, or registered a, a trademark in order to use it. Okay, the R symbol, however, is used in relation to registered trademarks. So once your uh, trademark becomes registered, and you do have to go through an active process to do that, then you can use the R symbol. Now the Benefits of using those symbols is that they um, act as a deterrent to any potential infringers. Okay, you don't have to display them, but I recommend that you do. Okay, so the benefits of trademark registration. 
Well, it gives you a, a period of 10 years exclusivity. Um, you can renew that 10 year period with, with further uh, periods of 10 years. So indefinitely you can own a registered trademark subject to paying the renewal fee. It gives you an exclusive right to uh, commercially use, license or sell your trademark and it places you in a stronger position to enforce your trademark because only registered trademarks can rely upon the Trademarks Act to enforce rights against a, a party that's misusing your trademark. So there's some strong benefits there. So what's trademark infringement? Well, it's very similar to copyright infringement. It's where a person uses a trademark that is substantially identical with or deceptively similar to um, a trademark owned by another person or, or company. So maybe if I was selling takeaway burgers and fries and nuggets and stuff like that, all the good stuff, um, and I used a, um, you know, a W for white, my surname's White, and it was a yellow, it was yellow art, it was a McDonald's logo upside down. Okay, maybe that would be trademark infringement. So that's an example. It might also be if I have a tennis website where I sell goods, uh, you know, shoes, rackets, tennis balls, stuff like that, and I'm using uh, the Nike logo and Prince logo and these other brands uh, without permission. That might be uh, trademark for in infringement as well. Um, also, an example of trademark infringement might be where you use another person's or, or company's trademark in a, a domain name or a Google AdWords campaign, and we'll touch a little further on that shortly. So um, that's an interesting uh, thing to consider. Um, some solutions. If you're going to use a third-party trademark, always obtain consent to use it first. And we have a, an e-book in the Learning Centre on trademarks, uh, and uh, I think it'll give you all the little uh, things that you need to consider when dealing in trademarks. Okay, moving on to mistake number three, deceptive trade practices. This is really interesting stuff in my view. Um, well, basically we have consumer protection laws in Australia, such as the Competition and Consumer Act, and it replaced, uh, two or three years ago, three years ago, it replaced the Trade Practices Act, which uh, many of you might recall. and uh, it. it tries to, it, it governs consumer activity, but it, it's there to protect uh, consumers really from uh, you know, all sorts of conduct. So examples of deceptive trade practices, uh, leading consumers to believe that an association or affiliation exists with another trader when it doesn't. So Mantra Resorts, they use Pat Rafter um, a, as a, um, you know, an endorsement uh, of the brand. Um, if I went and knew, if I had a hotel and used uh, Leighton Hewitt, might be a bad example, but if I use, if I, maybe the Williams sisters, why not? If I use them with big cardboard cutouts at the counter uh, and, and I didn't have permission to do that, then that would be misleading and deceptive conduct because I've been misleading consumers to think that uh, the Williams sisters have something to do with my resort or it's their preference of, uh, of place to stay, etc. False testimonials. Uh, this will constitute misleading and deceptive conduct. Now, I know that we all like to use testimonials uh, because it, uh, you know, it's social. It, it can it, it convinces potential customers that uh, you know they ought to book your goods or services. It gives you credibility. Um, make sure that they're accurate and you have permission to use them. Really, really important. We've seen cases around that, and we'll talk about one later on. Um, the origin of goods. If you're selling. Uh, uh, you know, if you're selling bottled water and you say that it comes from the springs of Fiji but it comes out of a tap, uh, that's going to be uh, you know, false origin of goods. Um, false sale prices, you can't say that it's usually $200 a night, for example, for some accommodation when it's never been $200, it's only been uh, $179, for example. You must be able to substantiate conduct. Now, I came across a case study that's a little bit, uh, you know, to do with, well, it's a lot to do with the tourism industry, actually, and it's called Chen's case, Mr. Chen. He operated a website selling tickets to the Sydney Opera House. Uh, his website was virtually identical to the official Opera House website. His ticket prices were inflated and some were even invalid. The ACCC, which is the uh, Australian Competition and Consumer uh, Commission, um, it's the watchdog in Australia. It argued that Mr. Chen engaged in misleading and deceptive conduct and he made false representations in relation to having approval to sell the tickets. He was in no way um, affiliated or endorsed by the Opera House. He was just marching his own uh, 
feet, the court agreed with the ACCC and made a declaration as such. Um, so he uh, was subjected to some financial penalties. So you know you need to make sure that you're not misleading uh, consumers in any way. Solution: be able to substantiate your claims if required, and you will get challenged sooner or later. Not everyone, but many do. Um, and again, there's some advertising and marketing law articles in the Learning Centre of our website, and uh, you know there's a handful of those from memory that have to do with being able to substantiate your conduct, and also examples of big companies that are falling foul of these provisions. And we're talking companies like Harvey Norman um, and, and some bigger uh, telephone companies as well. Those articles are on the website. Any questions, Susan? No, not yet. Does that mean that uh, everyone's asleep or I'm explaining it so well? I think because you're explaining it so well. <laughs> oh, I feel like I haven't taken a breath yet, so feel free to put your hand up with any questions. <laughs> okay, privacy. This is a fairly dry area of the law. You guys are probably thinking, but so is all the other stuff. Um, but uh, here we go. Um, the Privacy Act. This is the act that's, uh, or the legislation that's undergoing uh, a little bit of change at the moment. Not radical change, but some change. Um, it regulates information privacy only. So not, you know, people looking through your window at night. Not that sort of uh, privacy issue, but information privacy. It does not apply to businesses with an annual turnover under three million dollars. Now, I think from a lawyer with my lawyer's hat on, it's unfortunate that. Um, the new legislation um, won't be dropping that amount because not too many businesses, uh, I don't have the percentage, but not too many businesses in Australia have uh, annual turnover of, of more than three million. So the Privacy Act doesn't apply to a lot of businesses. Um, what's personal information? We talk about personal information. We've all said it before, but that's my personal information. But the, the definition under the Privacy Act is information or an opinion irrespective of whether it's true or not, about an individual whose identity is apparent, so uh, if it names you, for example, or it can be reasonably ascertained that it's you from the information or opinion. So it's about you, stuff that can identify you and is personal to you. So when you're collecting, start thinking about your customers and clients. When you're collecting information about them, that person has a right to know that the information is being collected, uh, how the information will be stored, how it will be used, and under what circumstances the information may be disclosed. So in your privacy policy, you want to be talking about things like we won't sell or rent the information to third parties, we'll only use it to administer our website and our business and offer you some promotions, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I won't go too much more into the details of a privacy policy, but they're the, the things that are uh, addressed there. In relation to privacy, an emerging issue is cloud computing, um, and there's uh, ten or so uh, privacy principles, national privacy principles in the Privacy Act. And number nine is in relation to transported data flow. And what it's talking about is where you send information outside of the country. And many of us might think, "Oh, but I never do that." But if you're using something like uh, Gmail, Hotmail, Dropbox, um, cloud-based uh, accounting software, then you're sending information outside of the country. Whenever it's in the cloud, we're talking about information that's being stored, not on the cloud, that's just a, uh, a metaphor, I guess, but uh, we're talking about information that's being stored on a number of computer servers, and they're not all based in Australia. In fact, probably none of them are. They're not all based in the, on the one server. They're split up over numerous servers. So you might find that uh, with Gmail, predominantly it might be uh, your information might be stored or the information about your clients might be stored in the US, but also Sweden, Norway, and, and the Netherlands, so, or China for that matter. So once you use that cloud technology, um, information uh, is out of your control. And what we do know is once the information hits the United States, it's a uh, you know, game on, open slather. They can pretty much do anything with your information. It's very difficult to avoid using some form of cloud computing, um, but uh, you may want to assess the use of it when uh, you know, considering your business practices. So what's the solution? I recommend, even if you're not uh, 
you know, even if you are three million dollars or under in turnover, I recommend that you prepare and implement a privacy policy and strategy specific to your business and display it on your website. This will give, uh, in fact, there's evidence around this. This will give consumers um, of your products or services increased levels of um, confidence when engaging you for the, your products or services. Um, if you have a privacy policy, it's very important to follow it. Otherwise, it might be misleading and deceptive conduct. And under the new legislation, there are penalties, financial penalties. Um, again, there's some articles uh, in the privacy law section of our learning center. Okay, use of a competitor's trademark in your Google AdWords campaign. Okay, so for anyone that's not sure what Google AdWords are, put very simply, it's a form of pay-per-click advertising or PPC advertising. It's where you can pay to nominate certain terms and when a consumer or shopper um, nominates those terms in, in Google, um, your, depending on your, um, the budget that you've allocated for your Google AdWords campaign, your advertisement will come up in the sponsored uh, section of Google. So we've all seen those sponsored sections before. It's not guaranteed to come up. Uh, the bigger the budget you put in, uh, the more likely it will. Um, but that's what Google AdWords are. So there's been a temptation for, for example, McDonald's to put in, uh, this is not actual fact, it's just an example. Um, McDonald's to put in uh, Hungry Jacks, include Hungry Jacks, the words, in their Google AdWords campaign. So when someone searches Hungry Jacks, McDonald's will appear. It's probably a poor example because McDonald's wouldn't be interested in doing that, but many smaller traders, uh, business owners engage in that sort of conduct. But it's a real no-no and it can give rise and has given rise to misleading or deceptive conduct, trademark infringement and or passing off. And passing off is uh, an area of law that we might rely upon if we don't have a registered trademark to say that someone else is trying to pass off as being affiliated or associated with your business. So our firm is Pod Legal. Minder Ellison is a, a much bigger firm. Um, if we use Minder Ellison in our keyword, uh, you know, as a keyword in our Google AdWords campaign, we're probably in breach of some of those laws. Uh, again, it's a real no-no. Solution, pretty straightforward. Don't use a competitor's trademark in your pay-per-click advertising campaigns. Um, you very easy for the other party to catch you out in evidence. Okay, violation of spam laws. Okay, believe it or not, there are spam laws in Australia. Uh, we might not think that, but there has been for 10 years now. The Spam Act 2003 governs uh, uh, spam in Australia. So what is spam? We all sort of know, you know what it's like to be spammed. We kind of know what it is. It's unwelcome emails. But its technical uh, definition is that it's an electronic message that contains an invitation to do business and that has been sent without the consent of a recipient. So put simply, it's a commercial electronic message that's been sent without consent. Okay, so an unsolicited commercial electronic message. So how do you comply with the Spam Act? Well, firstly, uh, you need to obtain consent prior to sending. And there's two different types of consent. There's consent where I say, oh, yes, yeah, Susan, please send me uh, uh, any, any emails or, or SMSs in relation to uh, your services. And there's a different type of consent which is called inferred consent or implied consent. And that is, Susan and I have had a business relation for some time. I've in a roundabout way consented to her sending me those types of commercial messages. So that's consent. That's one of the three things you need to do to comply with the Spam Act. The second is identify your business as the sender. So it doesn't matter whether you're using email or, or uh, SMS or multimedia messages. You need to identify yourself as the sender. If I sent uh, someone a commercial electronic message today, I'd have to have their consent and I'd have to say, this is pod legal sending it. And I really should in an email be uh, displaying my contact details as well. I also need to provide a functional unsubscribe facility so a person can easily and readily unsubscribe. Not a tricky one, not one that doesn't work and they have to contact you to get you to unsubscribe. Um, not one that says, oh, but haven't you made a mistake and, you know, we really want you to stay, you know, please confirm that you want to unsubscribe. That's not acceptable. Okay, so in order to comply with the Spam Act, consent, identify, 
and have a functional unsubscribe facility. Now just backtracking to the top to, uh, bullet point there, electronic message doesn't include phone, okay, but if you're going to be phoning businesses up to invite them to do business in some way, you need to uh, uh, comply with the do not call register. Make sure whoever you're calling is not on that register, otherwise there are further consequences. Some examples, okay, Tiger Airways, these are all fairly recent cases, all three of these. Um, they recently got a 110,000, uh, these three were all this year, $110,000 penalty um, for failing to unsubscribe someone from their database. So someone has said, please don't send me stuff, I've unsubscribed, and then Tiger Airways continued to send them messages. In relation to unsubscribing, there's a couple of things you need to know, but the main thing is that under the Spam Act, once someone says please unsubscribe, or once they use your unsubscribe facility, whether you do anything or not, doesn't matter. Okay, you need to do something, but if you don't, it doesn't matter, the law doesn't care. They give you five days, five business days to remove that person. So on the sixth business day, they uh, after six business days, if you send out another unsolicited commercial electronic message to that recipient, it will be spam. Okay, so you've got five days under the legislation. Okay, McDonald's, for such a big organisation, this was a shocker. Um, they didn't have consent. Um, recipients could not unsubscribe, so there's no functional unsubscribe facility. Okay, just backtracking in relation to no consent, what they were doing was engaging in what we call friend get friend marketing. And that is, uh, you know, refer this uh, electronic message, commercial electronic message, onto a friend. So the friend that they were, that people were referring it to, wasn't consenting to receive information about burgers or special deals. Okay, so they didn't establish consent. Now it's a little bit different to straightforward consent that you know seems really obvious. The friend get friend marketing, which is really popular, um, you need to make sure that the friend at the you know very end has consented. Very difficult to do, and you will see on my third little bullet point there, sub bullet point. McDonald's got a formal warning. Don't ask me why, because I don't know. Um, I don't know if they paid off the ACMA with uh, burgers or Ronald, you know, hosted the party. For, I don't know what happened, but they didn't get a fine, which I find to be outrageous. If ever there was a great time to exercise a, a bit of muscle in relation to spam, I feel like it, it could have been uh, achieved through that case study. Okay, the third one, which was the most recent of these three examples. Seller masters selling wine online, no unsubscribe facility, failure to unsubscribe, and a hundred and ten thousand dollar penalty. So, you know, hundred and ten thousand must have just about um, crippled Tiger and possibly seller masters, but McDonald's, uh, who, who no doubt could afford it, got the warning. So, go figure that one. Any comments, Susan? Um, no, no questions. But um, from the audience, but I have a question. Um, it's come up from operators that I've been dealing with okay. previously um, where they yes. want to start doing an email newsletter to their database, but they haven't mm -hmm. actually received formal consent previously. It's just from their database of people who have stayed with them, um, you know, built up that data over time. How can they, are they able to say, for instance, send out an initial email newsletter saying this is what we're about to do, this is how this is what we're going to um, let you know, this is what it's all about. Please opt in or opt out at this point. Can you do it that way so you can you're still getting the consent but sort of after the fact? Well, <laughs> yeah, very, very risky practice and I, I wouldn't recommend that any uh, business does that. You need to have consent prior to sending. So if it was an accommodation provider for example and people are booking Quite often, excuse me, there might be a, um, a little uh, checkbox to check and uh, by uh, a person ticking that, they might be agreeing to uh, receive commercial electronic messages or special offers in the future. So I would recommend if uh, um, you know, an accommodation provider was looking at uh, developing their database, growing their database, they would definitely include something like that on a, a booking form or on their website. And that way you're actually uh, obtaining consent. But to send commercial electronic messages out without consent, very risky. Now if you're operating with uh, 
uh, through a database now that you've grown over some time but you're not sure whether people have consent or not, have provided their consent or not, I suggest you go through one by one and uh, cleanse your database and uh, yeah, you run a risk if you say, hey, do you mind if I include you? Uh, you can't put that reverse onus on, on a person, on a recipient. Uh, okay. You need to provide consent. Okay, thank you. Anything and I... outside having... Sorry. No, you're right. <laughs> I was going to say anything outside having express or strong inferred consent, you're running a risk. Okay. All right. Now, I've just had a I question come sense. in Yes. Um, from Julia, and she's asked, I sent a departure letter asking, is this okay? Sorry, could you repeat that, Susan? I sent a departure letter asking, is this okay? That's from Julia. A departure letter? A departure letter. So I'm assuming, Julia, what I might do is I might put you off mute, Julia, so you can might um, ask Jamie directly. That might be easier. So let me just go back to, oh, it's not letting me take you off mute. For, I'm not sure why. That's very strange. Okay, sorry, she's just coming. I can't unmute you for some reason, Julia, but she's just come back and she's got, I send a departure letter asking, but then she's like thanking the guest for staying, um, and then in that letter, I'm assuming she's asking, you know, would you like to be a part of our database? Yes, she just said yes. Yeah, I don't think that, that I don't think that that's uh, inviting them to do business necessarily. Although that's a very broad and loose sort of uh, term. If they've stayed with you, I think there might, you know, be a reasonable expectation that they would get a follow up uh, piece of correspondence. Um, yeah, I wouldn't think, don't, please don't take this as strong legal advice, but uh, my feeling is that that would probably be okay, but if you limited it to exactly that, but if you were out there talking about uh, in follow-up uh, correspondence, talking about your next special offer and things like that, I think you might run a risk. I would do that sort of thing uh, in print perhaps, but um, yeah, there's an element of risk, but probably it's okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. I just looked at the time, so I'm going to have to uh, move through some of these last things fairly quickly. Um, solution, make sure you comply with the Act. Uh, and you might want to display a, a spam statement on your website. This is a tiny document, tiny expense, and it will instill conf uh, confidence in the people using your website. Um, and again, CL Resource Centre, Learning Centre for articles on that. Mistake number seven, overlooking legal aspects of social media. I'll go through this fairly quickly because a lot of it uh, we've discussed, but um, I guess social media is just another medium for publishing information and communications. Um, the same legal rules that apply in the real world apply, well, the, not the real world, the, the paper-based world apply to the online environment, including social media. Most platforms will have their own rules. Uh, they're all fairly similar. I won't go through all those, but yeah, basically behave yourself when you're using uh, social media. A case study, Damien O'Keefe up in Cairns, uh, ranted about his employer on a Friday afternoon. His employer was a good guy at Cairns. Um, he was on his own computer on a rostered day off. They messed up his commission pay. He was absolutely livid and gave them a, a really good spray. His employment was terminated. He uh, launched an unfair uh, dismissal claim and the action was unsuccessful because the good guys had uh, social media policies in place. So the lesson there is make sure that uh, if you have employees, you have a social media policy in place. There's been other case studies, sorry, to also show that it's not even enough to have a social media policy in place necessarily. The Fair Work Commissioner has said you also need to train to that policy. Don't get a policy written and keep it in the top drawer. Make sure people understand it and they learn about it. Okay, a couple more case studies. Lindsay Stone here. This is in the US, uh, making an offensive gesture alongside a silence and respect sign at Arlington National Cemetery in the US. Uh, the image went viral and was heavily criticised. Facebook group named Fire Lindsay Stone quickly amassed more than 32,000 likes. She and the photographer public apologised but were both terminated by their same employer. Uh, she said, I had no idea what I was going to hurt anybody. It was never my intention. So the, the point behind this uh, case study is that it, you don't have to be at work for your conduct to be connected with work. So you could be liable for conduct um, that has the possibility of um, 
bringing your uh, employer into disrepute or, or or something like that. So the lines are blurred now in terms of employment. There's no no longer work and home. Uh, it's uh, it can be considered all the one thing. A couple of examples here, a couple of case studies here where campaigns went wrong. So if you're going to do a campaign, use uh, uh, for example the Tourism Australia campaigns as a, a, an example, not these ones. Uh, ben Don, uh, this was a lovable besties campaign where they offered prizes to women posting selfies and, and friends wearing underwear on the Ben Don Facebook page. A complaint to the uh, Australian, uh, uh, sorry, Australian Advertising Standard Board was that it was pretty close to encouraging child pornography and the ASB upheld those complaints. Now there was no fines, uh, they had to take down the campaign but this made uh, uh, news headlines. I was asked to comment on this uh, News Limited and uh, the brand reputation uh, suffered as a consequence of it. Another one, some people might think that this is relatively, uh, you know, not harmful but uh, Let's see, the complaint representation of women as an animal, a woman as an animal, and the restraints used were offensive. The ASB, again, the, uh, that was the Advertising Standards Board, said it was exploitative to women and, the, and that the woman would soon be naked from the shearing. Um, so a campaign that might have started out being witty by some advertising agency um, can backfire and, and have a negative consequence on your brand. So. Really, really be careful when you're creating your campaigns or, or using imagery on your Facebook page. Solution, don't overlook legal issues associated with uh, social media. It's a really active area of law at the moment. We, uh, being social media lawyers, um, we get a, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, cases in involving the misuse of social media and, and content uh, used in social media where it might be defamatory or, or uh, capable of upsetting someone or, or offending someone. Again, there's articles in our resource center. Okay, this is the eighth one that I added. Uh, I mentioned at the start of the presentation this used to be seven mistakes, it's now eight. Um, this is really, really uh, a complex area of law or a messy area of law because we have state-based rules for a start. So trying to find out whether or not you need a permit in any particular state in relation to a particular type of competition or promotion you're running is a nightmare, not easy. The good news is in the next week or so we're going to have a matrix that's going to assist uh, you all and uh, in your requirements for a permit or how to avoid a permit if that's what you want to achieve. So I'm not sure, Susan, how we get that out to everyone but uh, um, feel free to contact us and we'll provide it. But as I say, it'll be about a week away. There's two types of promotions or competitions, games of skill and games of chance. They're important terms to understand when you're decide, uh, deciding or determining whether you're going to require a permit or not. Um, social media platforms will have their own rules, for example, Facebook, and Susan and I were talking about this just before this uh, webinar started, and Facebook um, on the 27th of August this year, uh, a couple of weeks ago, relaxed their laws around promotions. There used to be quite a few, but um, it is far more relaxed, and we'll discuss that very briefly shortly. You will need to have terms and conditions. Now it's not law necessarily, it, it's mandatory if you require a permit, but I strongly recommend, strongly, strongly, strongly recommend you have terms and conditions in place um, to avoid disputes and they will happen. Uh, I've seen them happen over the prizes that are bags of lollies. So I've seen all sorts of uh, disputes arise over very small prizes. So your terms and conditions will typically cover things like commencement and end of competition dates and draw dates, how a prize will be drawn, how winners will be notified, publication of winners, values of prizes and total prize pool, things like that. As I said, recent relaxation of terms by Facebook, they've stripped it right back. Now they're basically saying, hey, don't get us involved, we don't want to be liable. So there's a couple of important things that you need to include in your terms and conditions. What is the likely imp impact of the relaxation of Facebook rules? Well, I think now, uh, as Susan and I were discussing, pretty much anyone can get in and have a go at running a competition uh, in the timeline of their Facebook page. That sounds like a great opportunity for many, but really think it through before you do it. And I'm certainly not saying don't do it. Um, competitions and promotions can be great, um, but make sure that you have some terms in place. Make sure it's not going to backfire. Um, and make sure that you comply with uh, 
any state laws that might apply in terms of a permit and the few things that Facebook uh, require you to do. So what's the big risk? I think the big risk here, and we're going to see plenty of it, unfortunately, and that is damage to a brand. Uh, I can see people going out saying, uh, you know, I ended a competition on Big Brand A's uh, Facebook page. I was supposed to have won a holiday. Uh, they changed it. Now, uh, instead of going to New York for 10 days, I'm, I'm going to uh, Tweet Heads for four days. I can say Tweet Heads because that's where I was uh, from. I spent a lot of time there. It's not near as good as the Sunshine Coast or anywhere in Queensland or Melbourne or New York. Okay, moving on. So overall solutions, and I'll touch on these very quickly. Uh, assess and modify your conduct always. Always have a think about what you're posting online, how you're conducting yourself, your business practices. Display legal documents applicable to your business, and I won't go into each of these, but you can see the types of documents. General terms of use that exclude liability, privacy policies. If you're selling widgets, purchase and shipping terms, you know, you're going to receive it in seven days. We use Australia Post, uh, Express Post, uh, refund cancellations, that type of thing. If people can upload content, they need to follow some rules. You should have terms of use on your Facebook page and website relating to social media terms. These are small documents, small uh, ticket price. So don't be overwhelmed. We're talking hundreds rather than thousands. The benefits. Uh, you know, limit liability, resolve disputes quickly and hopefully in your favour. Liability associated with your website or Facebook will be limited as I just mentioned. Uh, consult a, an internet or an IT lawyer, not a property or family lawyer. If you have a property or family uh, law matter, don't come to me because I wouldn't know where to start. So get the right lawyer is uh, what we're talking about. Ensure that you display the legal documents specific to your online practices. Be really careful of the websites where you can download documents for $9 or so. Um, though those documents aren't always right, believe it or not, and they don't come with legal advice uh, specific to your business. Um, there is a general e-book in the Learning Centre about, uh, it's called Your Website is it Exposing You to Legal Risk. It's going to talk about many of the, the different uh, things that we've discussed today. Okay, so in summary, Legal rules apply online. Don't think that they don't. For every uh, paper-based uh, law, there's an equivalent online um, or the same law online. Manage the legal risk. Okay, uh, It is a real risk and with a little bit of management um, and proactivity, you can manage it well. Get specialist assistance. Uh, uh, go to the uh, right lawyer. Okay, any questions? Okay, none coming through at the moment, but I do have one for you, Jamie. Um, mm -hmm. Regarding back on the Google AdWords, um, yes. just recently Google actually have revoked um, their uh, trademark policy for here in Australia. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if this still has any implications or something that we may still need to consider, but I'll just, that they brought it out earlier. It said Google recently announced a revision to its AdWords trademark policy, keywords that were previously restricted as a result of a trademark complaint and investigation are no longer restricted in Australia and other places. Um, this mm. means an advertiser can use a third party's trademark as a keyword in its ad words. This amendment brings Australia in line with how the ad words trademark policy is applied to other parts of the world. And it says while this change will not prevent a trademark owner from making a complaint about the use of their trademark in a competitor's ad words, Google will not act to prevent the use of that trademark. So was, yeah. is that something that still sh we should still be aware of here in Australia? That, I mean, obviously people can still complain, but is that mm. going to mm. cause any issues? Yeah, well, they're just Google rules. And in the scheme of things, Google rules don't really matter. Um, so everything I've said uh, remains. So okay. if someone's using your trademark, for example, in their Google AdWords campaign, if Mantra is using someone else's, um, they need to, uh, uh, you know, the same laws will apply, whether it be trademark infringement, misleading, deceptive conduct or passing off. Those laws still apply irrespective okay. of what Google might say. I think the motivation for Google is just to uh, not get involved. They, they don't want to take on any liability uh, as a, a platform. Uh, they don't want to be involved with the infringement as a second, you know, in terms of secondary liability or anything like that. So 
You know, it's interesting that they, they've done that and uh, yes, it does bring uh, the treatment of Australia and Google in, in line with other countries, but it has absolutely no impact on our laws at all. Okay. That'd be like Facebook coming out and, and saying that they're changing, uh, you know, the Australian legal landscape because they're going to change their terms and conditions or policy. It okay. just, it has little impact. No, that's good to know. So, because no doubt I'll get that question quite a lot now when I deal with operators directly. So, thank you. Sure. Um, anyone else good have question. any? Yeah, well, I thought I'd just better check that because uh, when they brought that out, I thought, oh, oh, okay, but that's good to know. So, um, anyone else have any other questions for Jamie at all? Or hands up, or you can type it into the questions box. Doesn't look like you must have covered everything so well, Jamie, that no one has any questions for you. <laughs> well, there's a good chance that they're still taking it all in. So, uh, if there's any questions later on, uh, feel free to email me. Um, is it all right to give my email address? Yeah, or they there can come. Th they can come yeah. through us as well. That's no problem. Okay. Yeah. You'll catch me on Twitter. My face. My uh, email address is not on that slide for some strange reason, but I'm easily contactable. Just Google me. Um, and I'd be delighted to answer any further questions. And I'm happy for the slides to be uh, provided to people as well. Great. Susan. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, so if there's no other questions, thank you everybody for attending. I just wanted to give a quick uh, spruik for next week's webinar. We've got another great guest presenter coming along next week, which is actually from TripAdvisor. So if anyone's um, keen to attend that one, please do. Just go to where you registered for this one today and you can simply register there as well. So once again, thank you everybody for coming along today. I appreciate you taking the time and a big thank you to Jamie and Pod Legal for coming along and being a guest presenter for us today as well. So as I said, this was recorded, so we'll be putting this up online hopefully very soon. So stay tuned and thank you and have a great week, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.